So far we have talked about various types of materials, but in this last series we will enter into the application of this knowledge domain. That means now we are going to talk about how all this knowledge that you have acquired so far on the basis of that knowledge, how you can basically select a particular material for some engineering design applications. So, there will be various case studies that we will carry out and this will be really the test of how much knowledge you have acquired towards the material properties. So, what we are going to talk about for example, is uh, you know the general today we will discuss all these things in principle and from the next class we will talk about that how to apply it. So, today we are going to talk about the general you know uh, aspects of the mechanical design, design flow chart and the doubling time issues, resource availability, eco efficiency and finally, the SB chart. The knowledge of SB chart which is the culmination of today's lecture is very, very important for us to apply from the next lecture onwards. So, let us first talk about that what do we mean by mechanical design, because I said that we are going to talk about material selection for mechanical design. Now, mechanical design refers to the mechanical component design which has definitely some mass and which will carry some load that means, it is functional and also it may have other functionalities such as thermal or electromagnetic requirements and then it must be manufactured. So, that is the you know that is the way this kind of design would qualify. And the design per se would refer to the selection of engineering materials based on a set of defined properties. So, it will be naturally an iterative process. What we will try to do is that corresponding to some functional requirement, let us say you have you know functional requirement A. So, you have a particular functional requirement let us say, then corresponding to this requirement we will uh, say F 1 is the functional requirement, we will try to find out that what is the performance index that we should look for. And this performance index we should look for from the material property point of view. So, this will be from the material property point of view. And then we will you know go through all our knowledge of the materials and we will see that which group of materials can give you the best performance index that means can satisfy this function in the very best manner. So, that is what is the essence of the whole direction. Now, in any particular design when we do what exactly you know we actually carry out in this design process. So, we first start with the market need, what are the design requirements in a market. Let us say tomorrow I want to develop you know I find out that there is an energy crisis. So, there is a market need of developing a micro scale energy solution. Then we have to find out what is the design requirement, do I need to actually design a system which is which can extract energy from say wind energy or from water or maybe from both or from vibration. So, we have to find out what are the design requirements, based on that we have to go for a conceptual solution. So, at this stage we have to determine what is the function structure that means, how many functions this particular concept has to satisfy and then we have to seek what are the working principles corresponding to you know this function structure and we have to select evaluate and select the concepts, because you can have multiple concepts right. So, one can give many design concepts say C 1, C 2, C 3. So, each concept you have to find out that in a something called P U chart, okay, you have to find out that which concept is good 
for a particular work and which concept is not so good. So, once we rank this concept, then we choose one concept from that and then we go ahead with the next part which is known as the embodiment design. In the embodiment design part, we actually develop the layout, scale, forms, etcetera and then we also work on the system model, we analyze the system and then we evaluate and select the layout. So, embodiment design is something like a detailed analysis that you have to carry out in order to know that what sort of material system you will need in terms of you know uh, materializing the concept. Then you have to come to the detail and in the detail part we are going to talk about uh, each of the you know sub assemblies look into it in details, then optimize the performance, optimize the minimize the cost and then choose the final set of material and the process. So, when we are at the conceptual stage, generally we do not select the material, but at the embodiment stage we have many candidate materials. So, at this stage we have many candidate materials. And when we are doing the detailed design, here we finalize the material selection. And then you know we see that how the product uh, specifications are satisfied and we can iterate that process. Okay. Suppose we are not happy with it, we may go back to the concepts, we may look into the other concepts like we can then work with concept 2 or concept 3 and then carry out the same process again and again until and unless we are satisfied with the solution of the system. Now, when we will be selecting a particular material for a particular function, what are the points that you have to keep in your mind? The first important point you have to keep in your mind is the money that is the price and availability of the material. So, that is the first important part we have to keep in our mind. Then the second is we have to look into the group of mechanical properties and in this group of mechanical properties we have to think of things like density of the material because many times your system is to be of lightweight. Then you have to think of the modulus because modulus is related to stiffness of the system. We will see it through some example in the next class. We may have to think of the damping because for dynamic works you know damping is very important. Then the yield strength, the tensile strength, the hardness, fracture toughness, fatigue strength, the thermal fatigue resistance particularly if it is for a high temperature application as well as the creep strength. So, these are like certain very important mechanical properties other than that there could be some other some more properties very specific to the application, but these are definitely some of the very important mechanical properties that we need to look into before we select a particular material. Next, we are going to talk about uh, the other uh, you know properties like thermal, like optical, magnetic and electrical properties. This comes because a machine for example, today is usually multifunctional and it has to interact with a, a very complex you know environment. So, uh, you know you need to know about properties which are other than the so called mechanical properties of the system. Thermal property is one of the example uh, for a, you know for example, these gas turbine blades it has to work in a high temperature environment. So, you have to look into the conductivity of the material. So, thermal property comes into you know a very important property. There are some applications where the uh, you know for example, a, a kind of a transparent oven say if I have to design. Then I have to think of that the optical property should not be sacrificed with respect to temperature. So, then that also comes into the picture or let us say you have to design a microscope, then the optical property comes into the picture. 
magnetic and electric property comes into picture. For example, you know I mean just a some simple example that you have to design a motor housing. Now, the magnetic and the electrical properties of the motor becomes important for you. So, thus you know for even for mechanical design all these things actually gets coupled and this becomes important for us. Next is uh, there is chemical environment change. So, the oxidation corrosion becomes important. There could be things like uh, you know friction in the system. So, the frictional properties are important. There could be abrasion or wear and tear. So, this properties becomes important for us. Now, that is the property number set number 4 that we have to look into it. Then in the property set number 5, we have to look for the ease of the manufacturing and the joining. So, this is related to the manufacturability of the system. So, design for manufacturing. And then finally, we have to think of the appearance, we have to think of the texture, feel etcetera. So, the aesthetics becomes important, right? Aesthetics becomes important. So, thus this six property set becomes important for us. Now, once we know that these are the property sets, then we have to you know start to look into that what are the you know specific property level for each of the you know property set. For example, price and availability are the first important property set I told you. So, if you look into the relative prices of a system, you would see that diamond, platinum, gold, silver, these are all very expensive, right. So, uh, till this point we are at the very expensive level of the property set. So, naturally you cannot use them unless the you have a very, very compelling situation of using such material. So, the next interesting material which can be used is actually carbon fiber reinforced plastic. It is highly functional. I have told you when we have discussed about carbon fibers that some of the very high performance systems are designed using carbon fibers. So, this we can use and then uh, further for example, tungsten is one of the material for many you know space grade applications you will see that the tungsten is used. Okay. Then there will be titanium alloys once again for space grade applications and then polyamides, polyamides are like kevlons if you remember we have talked about kevlars right for bulletproof jackets so, this is like polyamides and then uh, once again magnesium alloys, then nylons, polycarbonate. So, where are we in terms of uh, for example, steel? So, steel is one of the cheapest material. So, if you look into this list for example, you will see that uh, the presence of steel or such material. Let us say here we have the aluminum alloys in this list. Okay. Even uh, below the aluminum alloys you can get epoxies, polyesters and glasses that means you can make GFRPs, glass fiber reinforced plastics and then down this line in fact, somewhere below this because it is not here covered I can see that the steel would come into picture. So, this is one of the cheapest material basically yeah, it is somewhere here as you can see that this is where is the steel. So, you can use also that as a baseline of your material selection. Let us say if steel is 100 units of uh, you know in any units in this particular units it could be in terms of uh, basically pound or dollar. So, uh, however, if it is 100 units in comparison to that if you look at uh, the aluminum alloys then this is somewhere around 650 units. So, that means it is you know that many times expensive aluminum as a material. So, you have to be cautious of that what is the going to be the cost of the system as you are trying to improve the performances using a better material. And similarly from aluminum let us say if you want to jump to you know something like magnesium alloys 
this is about 1000 units. So, this is 10 times more expensive than steel. If you want to go for something like tungsten or super alloys 5000, so it is like 50 times more expensive. If you want to go for something like CFRPs, then it is 20,000. So, that means this is 200 times more expensive than steel. This is very, very important for us because we will indeed save lot of weight uh, by using carbon uh, you know more expensive than steel, by using carbon fiber reinforced plastic. But we have to be ready to spend a 200 times more money for that system. Now, uh, let us look into the availability of the materials. There are two groups of it that is you know availability in the earth's crust and availability in oceans and in atmosphere. Of course, atmospheres you get mostly gaseous substances, but in the ocean there are certain things which are very peculiar for example, magnesium good supply from the ocean comes. Okay. So, that is also used as one of the structural materials. However, most of the materials that we use they actually come from the earth's crust itself and in terms of abundance you can see that aluminum is about 8 percent. So, aluminum is highly abundant next to that is in fact steel, but aluminum's processing cost is more that is why aluminum is actually more expensive than steel. So, this actually gives us a broad picture of you know what is the abundance of different materials. Now, once you know the abundance, there is a particular knowledge which is very important at this stage that is known as the doubling time. So, what is the doubling time? The definition of doubling time is that it is the period of time required for a quantity to double in size or value. That means, if you think of it that this is like x axis is time and y axis is the demand of a particular material and let us say that the demand is increasing exponentially. So, if it is increasing exponentially, then at a particular time t 1, if the demand is d 1, how much of time would it take say t 2 to uh, go to d 2, where d 2 is actually twice of d 1. So, that timing that is needed between uh, you know this T 1 to T 2 that is what is the doubling time that is needed. Now, uh, if you you know assume a exponential growth in many cases the growth rate will be given to you and hence by knowing the growth rate and logarithmic you know base of with respect to 2 you can actually approximately find out the doubling time to be about 70 over r. So, that means, if I know the growth rate, then I can find out that what is the doubling time and if I know the doubling time, then I know that a particular material is of very high demand, which means you know as I will be designing, I have to be get ready of a situation where its cost may increase because its doubling time is small. So, a material whose doubling time is more essentially is a, a either a cheaper material or that material is uh, you know completely rare. So, either of the two cases, but the doubling time helps you to take a decision on that. Now, this also in terms of the availability, this also brings us to a, the very famous McElvey diagram. Okay. So, what this diagram tells us is that uh, this is like you know uh, uh, engineering materials, this Asby and Jones book you can use it for your reference for this particular beautiful diagram that this actually tells us that uh, you know there are two things one is called reserve and the other one is actually uh, you know the total resource space. So, uh, you can have actually a very big resource space like this. Okay. But a good part of this resource base uh, may be actually undiscovered or may be actually not economic. 
So, it is the economy level and the level of discover you know known part actually makes the reserve and rest of the things is your resource base which includes the you know reserve of course. Okay. So, uh, for example, if you consider you know aluminum uh, you know another point here it is important that uh, why some of the things are not economic. Like if you consider aluminum it takes about 280 giga joule per ton plastics 85 to 180 giga joule per ton. So, these are all high energy consuming copper 140. So, even if you find you know it may not be economically feasible to use such a material. So, hence you know uh, your uh, even though you have the resource you may not be able to consider it as your reserve because it is not profitable at that particular point of time. Now, some broad pictures I want to tell you for example, copper silver, tungsten, tin and mercury they are rarely available. So, you should avoid them by all means from your general design. Iron and aluminum are most widely available material. So, you should try to use them more. Steel consumption is doubling in every 20 years. So, it is taking time and it is cheaper. Aluminum consumption on the other hand is doubling in every 9 years. So, it is doing going at a even faster rate and polymers in every 4 years. So, you have to be cautious of this particular fact that at this point of time polymer is the most popular material is of highest demand next is aluminum and next is steel. So, accordingly you should select the material. How to encounter shortages of materials? Well, first of all you have to go for a material efficient design that means use less amount of material. For example, for a good surface property use cheap substrate and good surface finish. Okay. So, you have to have certain tricks of using more material efficient designs. Substitution, substitute rarer materials by the more available ones. For example, substitute copper by aluminum. In the you know electrical wires we have seen that this has already taken place. Recycling, use such materials which are recyclable material like aluminum. This has also been done today. So, these are certain strategies that you want to take in order to encounter the shortages of materials. Next is a very important point which is known as eco efficiency. Today we are very much conscious about the nature around us. Okay. So, uh, it is the eco efficiency which means a merging of ecological and economic goals together we have to think you know before selecting a particular material. So, we have to think of improving the productivity of energy and material inputs to reduce the resource consumption also cut the pollution per unit of output. Okay. So, we have to not only think of reducing um, my own cost, but also have to think of it that it should not affect the nature. So, uh, a win-win approach in this direction would benefit both the bottom line design and the environment itself. Just one example, in 1989 Proctor and Gamble they introduced a concentrated detergent powder okay, which is also called ultra detergents. They took up half the volume of traditional detergents. These products cleaned the same amount of clothes, but were more convenient for consumers to handle use 30 percent fewer raw materials, required 30 percent less packaging and substantially cut the energy needed to transport them. So, as a result this material was actually much more eco efficient material. There are seven dimensions of eco efficiency. One is to reduce the material intensity of goods and services, then reduce the energy intensity of goods and services. Uh, then reduce the toxic dispersion, enhance the material recyclability all are very simple. So, I am not explaining them, maximize sustainable use of renewable sources, extend the product durability, increase the service intensity of goods and services that means increase the you know kind of life of the material. So, greater the improvement in each or any of this dimension it is considered that your system is more eco efficient in terms of a product design. 
So, that means you see you are not only thinking of the material to serve the particular function, but also you are thinking what is the outcome of the use of that material you know to the environment around us. So, that is what you know forces us to look into these seven dimensions. Okay. Now, we have talked about the seven dimensions. Finally, you have to select the material property. To do that, a fantastic chart I will introduce you tomorrow is called Ashby chart. So, in this chart what you will get is that you will get uh, you know this is like you can develop a n dimensional picture out of it, but in each one of the dimension you will get a comparison between suppose two properties Young's modulus and strength or suppose density and something like Young's modulus. Okay, Young's modulus versus density or say density versus some other property of the system like strength of the system, strength density. So, you can by looking at this comparison charts, let us say if I consider one of these slice of these charts here like this is strength versus density. So, this is density and this is the strength. So, if I look at it, then I will see that the very low density materials are like foams then from there we are going to natural materials, then from there we are going to polymers, composites. So, gradually as I am increasing the density, the strength is also increasing okay. and then the ceramics. However, the problem is that if uh, you know if I have to go for too much of high density, then the structure may be very heavy in weight. So, if I want to go for low density relatively, but high strength then you choose something like CFRPs because the metals are you know. Uh, so, this is where it is, but the metals at the same strength level if you look at it that uh, you know they are actually an order of magnitude higher at the same strength level. So, that is why you know this 2D charts actually help us a lot in terms of selecting the material from a particular function point of view. These functions also you can plot on the SB chart like somewhere suppose if it is sigma f by rho that is what is your point. Then any material if it is here it is discarded because that is what is your functional chart level. Okay. You are searching for properties uh, you know on that line beyond this level not below this level. So, thus you know it helps us in terms of the choice of the materials. So, this we are going to discuss in the next class. I am going to talk about how to use SB chart and I am going to talk about the numerical problems on material selection. Thank you.